Thanks so much to the organizers for Thanks so much to the organizers for the invitation, and uh, thanks as well for putting me on a podium with the awesome uh, Ruth and Nagla. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, now, now, I think anyone who's planned a conference knows that you think about it, about the months and months of preparation uh, that then come together and coalesce uh, over just a few days. In a copyright and intellectual property reform context, we tend to think about this in years, and we saw it from the the slides earlier on from Ahmed, where you start seeing it's almost years and sometimes decades that then coalesce into uh, resolutions and treaties and other sorts of reforms. The same is true in a Canadian context, where uh, it was many, many years worth of debate around different kinds of reforms, but it all culminated in roughly a 14-day period, just literally a few days, when over a 14-day period, just over a year ago, I think Canada came together with a whole series of different reforms that left us uh, I would say, with the most co make, made us the most copyright user rights friendly uh, country in the world, operating at least within the traditional frames that Ruth was talking about. That came about over this period of July of June 29th to July 12th of last year, uh, included the culmination of copyright reform Bill C11 on the 29th. Uh, two weeks later, our Supreme Court of Canada released what's come to be known as the copyright pentology. It was five decisions all released in a single day. And just for good measure, in between, while we were catching our breath, the European Parliament rejected the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. So it was a pretty interesting two weeks. What I want to do with my talk today is talk a little bit about what happened and then try to explore towards the end a little bit on how or why it happened within a country like Canada, which operates not just within many of the traditional paradigms that we've heard talked about, but with the giant, the United States, directly to the south with significant pressures in terms of what our reforms might look like. So my starting point, though, will be the copyright reform package that we passed on June 29th of 2012. I'll go back many years. If we go back many years, the impetus for much of that reform would be the WIPO Internet Treaties, Pam Samuelson described back as the copyright grab. Um, we'll fast forward quickly, though, because when it really got started in Canada was in 2004. Uh, so Canada had been a signatory to those treaties dating back into 96, 97. Um, not much had happened, and many of the copyright groups were frustrated with the lack of movement on copyright reform. And they found in a particular member of parliament named Sam Bolte, she was at the time was a liberal government and she was a liberal MP. She was the chair of a committee on cultural issues, Canadian heritage issues, and, conv and was convinced to hold a series of hearings on copyright reform. The idea being that this committee would kickstart an effort to actually move forward with some of these sorts of reforms. And in fact, that policy or that approach worked. The committee's report was as maximalist as you could get. It was all about um, very tough implementations of those wiper internet treaties, extended licensing for the internet, uh, no new limitations and exceptions. I mean, it was truly, if you wanted to know exactly what maximalist groups were thinking about, that report would tell you. Uh, about a year later, even a little less than a year later, the government at the time introduced the first of what was to become several attempts at copyright reform. It was Bill C-60. And in a sense, true to that initial report, there wasn't much in the way of user rights. There actually wasn't anything in the way of user rights. Nothing new with respect to things like fair dealing or consumer exceptions. Nothing on internet-based exceptions. Uh, nothing on statutory damages. We have a statutory damages system that's somewhat similar to the United States, although with slightly lower numbers at $20,000 per infringement. Uh, although there was implementation of the anti-circumvention rules, the so-called digital locks rules, which were under the circumstances somewhat reasonable. And there were rules for inter internet intermediaries for the ISPs, which as we'll see, never really, re never really changes. The telecom companies and ISPs remain powerful lobbyists in my country as they do in many others. And their ability to ensure that their interests are met is the one thing that I think remains consistent throughout the evolution of Canadian copyright reform. I think it's fair to say that at that point in time, few would have thought that uh, a user rights movement would have emerged in Canada, at least at that stage. Uh, and yet, a funny thing happened on the way. About a year later, even about six months later, we had an election campaign, and Sam Bolte, the that chair of that committee, is running. It turns out that uh, the heads of the Motion Picture Association, the, so the radio, the sort of the music association, Canada's version of the RIAA, the Entertainment Software Association, and the Publer Association decided to put on a fundraiser for Ms. Bolte four days before the election campaign. 
I and, and many others thought that at a minimum the optics of that kind of campaign wasn't all that good. And so uh, I blogged about it, talking about that's what friends are for. And a lot of other people started blogging about it. The media picked up on it. And in her local riding in Toronto, uh, a lot of people in that community began picking up on it as well. And we talked at the time, I talked and some other people did as well, about taking a copyright pledge. The idea that if you were in that kind of position of power, you wouldn't take money from the very lobby groups that you were making these decisions about. And at the very first all candidates meeting within this riding, um, a packed house, uh, Ms. Bolte and the other candidates within the riding were asked whether they'd be willing to take the copyright pledge. Uh, the other candidates said that they would. Ms. Bolte said that she wouldn't let Michael Geist and the Electronic <laughs> Frontier Foundation zealots try to intimidate her and silence her, which I took to be a no. Um, in any event, the election runs over several weeks, and uh, this riding, only one of only two ridings in the larger Toronto area, the largest city in Canada, were the only two ridings to change from the prior election, with Ms. Bolte losing her seat, uh, with more than 5,000 people within that riding uh, switching votes. It was the largest shift in votes of any, any riding in the region. Quite amazing to see, and I think in some ways the first indicator that perhaps something was happening here. In the year or two that followed, we began to see groups emerge, well, many well-known musicians beginning to speak out, saying that the conventional recording industry wasn't speaking for them. Artists speaking out about their need for greater flexibilities when it came to copyright. We had the privacy community speaking out and coming together to talk about the implications that copyright reform had for them. And we had academics speak out as well. This was the first of three books over this period of time that, that I participated in that brought together many of the leading scholars from across Canada that found ways to get directly involved in the policy process by doing what they do best, publishing peer-reviewed works, making it available uh, through Creative Commons, open access licenses, so that it was available to the public, it was available to the politicians and the policymakers, and there was an opportunity to try to influence some of those policies. By 2007, we had what we thought would be the next bill. We now had a new government, a conservative government. And in December of 2007, on the notice paper, the notification that a bill was coming, we were told that yet another bill was about to happen. Now, as it happens, several days before that notice paper was launched, we knew that the bill was coming. I launched a Facebook group, which I know by today's standards seems um, kind of quaint and not all that interesting. Uh, but at the time, social media was still a little bit in its infancy, and the government in particular didn't know quite what to make of the fact that over the first few days and weeks of this Facebook group, first 1,000, then 2,000, then 20,000, uh, and then up to 90,000 people joined this group and began to inundate a minister's office uh, with concerns about a bill that hadn't even been introduced yet. Once again, people blogged about it. I blogged and so did others. The minister in question, you can see him here, Jim Prentice, uh, happened to be holding a holiday party just a couple of days before the bill was to have been introduced. And people drove from hours away just to spend a couple minutes with a minister about a bill that hadn't even been introduced yet to say they were concerned about where this legislation was about to head. In fact, the government blinked in the face of this pressure and decided not to introduce the legislation at that point in time, waiting six months as the, the pressure built. The media began to cover this story as well waiting six months, much later, to actually introduce this legislation, though I have to admit, even then, the user rights concerns that the minister was hearing about still weren't fully reflected in the bill. No changes on fair dealing, no new consumer exceptions or internet-based exceptions. About the only thing we had was a gimmicky change on stat statutory damages that set a cap of liability for people that download to $500. Yet when the minister was asked at a press conference, what happens to someone who uploads a video to YouTube? that's allegedly infringing, he had to acknowledge that, in fact, that wouldn't apply and the $20,000 statutory damage could. And so, uh, once again, in response to all of that, many groups began to speak out. It was introduced in June of 2008, and within three weeks, Industry Canada, the relevant government department, receives 30,000 physical letters from people concerned about where this legislation is headed. That fair copyright group that I launched ends up becoming uh, lots of fair copyright groups as local communities in many cities and communities across Canada launch their own groups. They begin to meet and talk about the kinds of things they might be able to do, both within Facebook and without, in terms of trying to meet with members of Parliament, creating different tools online to track media coverage and community-based events, even wearing t-shirts for Fair Copyright for Canada, and launching a YouTube contest with Bill C-61 They'll see 61 in 61 seconds where people 
creatively talked about the kinds of things that this legislation might create. In fact, so powerful was all of these changes that over the course of the summer, you had some members of Parliament hold town hall meetings on the issue of copyright. As numerous MPs told us, the copyright was one of the top three issues that they heard about all summer long. Uh, not with any sustained big organizations running this, but to, through a genuine grassroots effort to raise awareness. The bill dies with yet another election call, and when the government comes back, rather than immediately reintroducing the bill, it says, okay, fine, we've heard you, what we're going to do instead is launch a national consultation on copyright to consider what it is that we actually should put in the bill. Once again, thousands of people show up. In a context when in most consultations, you're lucky if you get a few hundred people respond to government requests for opinion. More than 8,000 people submit on this particular copyright consultation, arguing that the kinds of changes that the government had been putting forward were wrong and that greater flexibilities were needed as part of where the government was headed. And so that by 2010, when we got the bill that would effectively become uh, the legislation that has passed, the government began labeling it as balanced copyright recognizing that this is what many in the, the Canadian community were talking about, and recognizing as well the power of social media. So within two weeks of the bill being introduced, the Heritage Minister, now the Industry Minister James Moore, appeared before a group of uh, IP maximalist groups uh, and argued that they needed to take to social media and other media to confront the radical extremists who would oppose this legislation. <laughs> that helpfully provided the title for the second book that we did on this copyright bill, the Radical Extremism. But in any event, they took that message to heart from fair copyright, in this case to balanced copyright, this being a group that was launched online by the recording industry uh, to try to represent some of their views as part of the process. There was lots and lots of debate in Canada over a two-year over a two-year period from when the bill is introduced, but the reality is on that June 29, 2012, the bill is introduced largely unchanged. Yet what it includes is a dramatic change from where things were at only a few years later, earlier rather. First, we saw an expansion of fair dealing with inclusion of new purposes such as parity, satire, and education. A whole series of new consumer-related exceptions covering things like time shifting, format shifting, and new rights to make backup copies. New internet exceptions for education institutions to be able to use any works that they find online. And a new user-generated content exception that covers both creators as well as hosts of, of user-generated content where it's created for non-commercial purposes. We saw statutory damages reform with a new cap on non-commercial infringement of $5,000 for all liability. Digital locks was still there and not in a good way, but the changes were significant. Now, right in between, we did see the, the, the scenes that were familiar to many, of course, starting with the anti-counterfeiting tra trade agreement being signed, followed by the SOPA fight, and then ultimately on July the 4th, the EP rejecting act. But a week later, we got our own sets of decisions with the Supreme Court of Canada. I'll go back here to 1990, where the court's starting point as early, as late as 1990 is that copyright is passed with a single object, namely the benefit of authors of all kinds, whether the works were literary, dramatic, or musical. A single purpose, and it's just about uh, the benefit of authors. In 2002, the court begins to signal that there might be a change, saying that excessive control by holders of copyrights and other forms of IP may unduly limit the ability of the public do domain to incorporate and embellish creative innovation in the long-term interests of society as a whole or create practical obstacles to proper utilization. Two years later from that starting point comes a case involving legal publishers and libraries in which the court says that the fair dealing exception, like other exceptions, is a user's right, articulating a vision that those limitations and exceptions are not just limitations and exceptions, but rather rights that stand alongside creator rights. Now there were many that thought this might be mere rhetoric and wasn't really a vision of user rights as a right, and yet on that date back in July of 2012, and I don't have time to go into all the cases, so we did another book on these decisions, which are free to download, the Supreme Court of Canada came out with decisions that said this was not mere rhetoric. In one case involving the streaming of video games and the prospect of paying a second license for the music contained on the video game simply because the game was streamed rather than purchased in physical form, the court said that the Copyright Act includes the principle of technological neutrality and that layering of additional fees ought to be a non-starter. The question of payment for song previews on services such as iTunes, the court examined whether or not that might be considered consumer research for the purposes of fair dealing research 
and said that we ought to, ought to identify or interpret research in as broad a manner as possible, noting that research can include, frankly, anything, even if there's no purpose except for a personal interest. And then, in a case involving the use of materials within an educational context, uh, the court looked at a convention, what had been the conventional difference between, on the one hand, copies made by students, and on the other, copies made by teachers for students, which were treated differently for copyright purposes, and said, no, that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, we ought to treat all of that within the same context and treat it within fair dealing. And in fact, it doesn't end there. What happens is once you start down this path, we find the government's introduced counterfeit legislation, and despite the fact they had opposition parties saying that it ought to target things like the personal exception for travelers, it ought to target in-transit shipments, the government said no, that's not part of what we see as balance. And even within the TPP, though it's hard to know exactly where Canada stands, the WikiLeaks draft suggests that at least for the moment, Canada's been putting forward many of these same proposals within the TPP. So where do we stand now? In 2013, we've got fair dealing as a user's right. We've got expanded fair dealing purposes. We've got a notice and notice system for ISPs that doesn't involve the takedown without any evidence like notice and takedown, a user-generated content exception, the cap on statutory damages, the internet exception that I talked about. I've got to go quicker because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, and so lots and lots of colorful examples of all these sorts of things. Oh, very quickly, in just the last couple, two minutes that I think I have based on my watch. Uh, why did all of this happen? And I would say that there's three P's. First off is politics, of course. I mean, politics plays a huge role in this. And as I mentioned, the trade pressures in Canada, particularly U.S. pressure, meant that specifically for any circumvention or digital locks, that never changed, despite the fact that this was identified as really a core concern. We're not perfect by any means when it comes to some of our copyright reforms. Second, personalities matter. The people themselves matter. So the justices themselves, Justice, Chief Justice McLaughlin and Justice Abella, who wrote many of these decisions, who looked at these issues around intellectual property and copyright and said that approach back in 1990 is not the right one when it comes to IP, have made a huge difference. So too the politicians themselves, the identity of those ministers that looked at this and said we're going to begin to make changes, the identity of regular members of parliament, whether it was on the one hand someone like Sam Bolte with her vision, and on the other, another MP named Charlie Angus, who was the first to break which what had been almost a unanimous view within all parties, made an enormous difference in shifting some of the political context in Canada. But most important was the public. The public both using the social media tools that we saw to begin to ensure that they had a voice in all of this. Frankly, I think the copyright scholars to begin to do what they do to try to ensure that there was a foundation for when the Supreme Court of Canada was ready to begin to make changes. It could begin to cite to some of these articles as they did, to, to say that there is a strong legal foundation for where they are moving. But most important, it was the individual Canadians themselves. I'll conclude by noting that we talk about the numbers a lot, and I have as well here. The, the 90,000 that joined the Facebook group, the 8,000 that participated in the copyright consultation. But the number that came home to me the most was one at the very beginning of this process. When I asked someone working within a member of parliament's office, how many people from your riding does it take before an issue begins to resonate and your MP knows that they begin to start thinking about it? And I'm thinking I've got to get hundreds or thousands of people within the riding to send letters to this MP in order for the MP to begin to thinking about copyright. The answer that I got was two. Two letters from someone within the riding is enough for a member of parliament, at least in Canada, to know that if there are two people who take the time to write, that behind that are many others who want to speak out themselves, who have similar kinds of concerns, and there is a need to pay attention. And so when I think back of those two weeks that really changed the course of Canadian copyright, I think the real reason lies with the two people that were in the hundreds of ridings across the country that took the time to speak out on these issues. Thanks so much for your time.